this talk is uh, generally geared to how to select your active surveillance patients using all of the technologies that we have available now, bringing those to bear to uh, hedge bets and uh, adequately risk stratify patients in this space. So just as a historical review, um, I know all of you are fairly familiar probably with these uh, two cohorts, the Toronto Lori Klotz cohort, uh, 993 men, and Johns Hopkins cohort of uh, 1,298 men. Uh, both cohorts uh, were followed very closely, uh, fairly strict uh, entry criteria, particularly with the Johns Hopkins cohort, uh, using only very low risk uh, patients according to the Epstein criteria. Uh, and annual biopsies, so very rigorous uh, follow-up regimens. Still 37% 15-year treatment-free survival, so uh, uh, only a third uh, went through the active surveillance period uh, without, um, without undergoing treatment. Uh, similarly with the Toronto cohort, uh, 55%. Uh, and even with uh, all of uh, this rigorous work to adequately risk stratify these patients based upon clinical factors. Uh, there were deaths and uh, metastatic disease in multiple patients in both cohorts. Um, uh, two of the newer uh, uh, cohorts, the large cohorts, multi-institutional, GAP3 and Prius, uh, similarly they have high conversion to treatment and uh, a significant number of men that do ultimately develop metastatic disease and prostate cancer death. Uh, although these numbers are small in comparison to the number of men enrolled in these active surveillance uh, cohorts, uh, it's still rep they still represent uh, a number of men that potentially have curable disease uh, that go on to progress uh, while on active surveillance. And so an opportunity is missed there despite uh, our best efforts. So just looking a little bit more closely at the GAP3 cohort, um, this is the largest uh, active surveillance cohort. It's a uh, multinational cohort involving the US, Canada, Australia, UK, and uh, European countries, 15,000 patients. Uh, the median follow-up is short, but the maximum follow-up for those uh, uh, that were started earlier in the cohort is quite long, 20, 21 years. Uh, in this cohort, there was 46% that progressed uh, per their protocols, but 9.1% underwent treatment just basically based on patient and physician anxiety. So another potential opportunity to improve uh, risk stratification because potentially these patients uh, could continue without treatment and uh, avoid the morbidity associated with uh, prostate cancer treatment. Another interesting finding is that only 3.3% uh, switched to watchful waiting. So uh, these patients, although they're being followed for, followed for long periods of time, potentially for very low risk or low risk disease, are very seldom switching off of active surveillance to watchful waiting based upon their low risk factors. Again, uh, possibly due to patient or physicians uh, being anxious about cutting them loose from their protocol. So, what is the risk of adverse pathology in, in these uh, subgroup of patients? Uh, it's not uh, in, unsubstantial. So looking at the low-risk prostate cancer patients, the published literature, as much as 42 to 49% of, of patients have a risk of Gleason 6 uh, or greater, uh, at, uh, greater than great Gleason 6 on radical prostatectomy. Uh, and as many as 9 to 16% will have uh, non-organ confined disease. Uh, again, this is also fairly similar with the very low risk prostate cancer uh, patients. Uh, almost a third have Gleason greater than six at radical prostatectomy and very similar numbers of non-organ confined disease. All of this suggests that potentially we're missing some index lesions or understaging or undergrading these patients just solely based upon clinical staging uh, and trust biopsy. Uh, why does this matter? Well, uh, there's an uh, extensive amount of data on this, but just to cite two long-term uh, cohort studies, uh, the SPCG4 trial recently published their 29-year follow-up, and then Pat Walsh's uh, uh, cohort of patients with 30-year follow-up. Uh, those patients with extra prostatic extension in these groups uh, had 4.5 times the risk of distant metastasis, five times the risk of death from prostate cancer. Those with Gleason grade four or greater had uh, almost 10 times the risk of distant metastasis and five to 10 times the risk of death, death from prostate cancer. So I'd argue that adverse pathology is an important uh, clinical uh, uh, determiner of these long-term uh, oncologic outcomes. And 
Uh, when looking at some of the tools that we use, these are the Stevenson uh, nomograms. These are the major prognostic variables uh, that we use. Uh, surgical margin status, PSA doubling, doubling time in this space are a little bit less informative. Um, however, these models aren't perfect. So uh, active surveillance is increasing, uh, thankfully, among uh, all men with low risk disease, but particularly also with men that are younger. Uh, this necessitates uh, or and creates an opportunity to improve long-term risk predictions for us. So uh, how do we use today's tools and leverage uh, the technologies that we have to accurately risk assess these patients at the onset uh, of their enrollment into an active surveillance protocol? Uh, really with the goals to treat patients who are at risk for uh, adverse pathology and, and also avoid treatment in those who are safe to survey and avoid the morbidity associated with treatment. And I would argue there's two problems, essentially, with uh, using our traditional methods. One is undersampling, and one is undergrading or understaging based upon histologic uh, factors alone. So uh, two, two problems and really two solutions to this. So addressing uh, the solution of undersampling, uh, this is sort of a foundational study uh, that was published out of the NCI, 1,000 men. Uh, cohort study that underwent uh, both uh, MRI, ultrasound, fusion biopsy, and truss biopsy. Uh, the majority of these men had a prior negative biopsy, so there were very few bi uh, biopsy-naive patients within this cohort. The tar targeted biopsy diagnosed 30% more patients with high-risk cancers, uh, but adding truss biopsy to the targeted biopsy also led to 103 more uh, uh, cases of cancer, albeit the majority of these were low risk. Um, Taken together, I think uh, what you can add from that is that we can't forego standard biopsy with uh, MRI targeted biopsy alone. Um, and so uh, in this cohort, they compared to the gold standard of whole mount pathology on the 170 men that did undergo radical prostatectomy, their sensitivity was 77% and negative predictive value were 70%. So not perfect. So looking at uh, two large trials for biopsy-naive patients, uh, MRI uh, sensitivity uh, for clinically sensitive uh, significant prostate cancer was very high in the PROMISE trial. Uh, their sensitivity uh, compared to truss biopsy alone was very good. Uh, their positive predictive value uh, was uh, somewhat marginal because 418 out of the 576 men uh, had positive MRIs. Uh, one caveat to this study is that uh, they compared as their gold standard their template map mapping biopsy through a transperineal approach. So it assumes that uh, by targeting with a multiparametric uh, fusion biopsy, you would achieve similar diagnostic accuracy as a, as a uh, transperineal mapping biopsy, which um, may be institution specific. The precision trial uh, recently published in New England Journal of Medicine uh, randomized MRI uh, with or without targeted biopsy, depending on whether or not the MRI was uh, positive uh, against trust biopsy. Again, a clinically significant cancer diagnosis was uh, more common in the MRI targeted biopsy group versus trust biopsy alone. Uh, they diagnosed fewer men with insignificant or Gleason 6 by their definition prostate cancer uh, using truss biopsy. But a major caveat to this study is that the 30% of men that had negative MRIs uh, on the MRI targeted arm uh, had minimal follow up and they never underwent a biopsy. So uh, uh, it may or may not be applicable to your practice if, if you don't include the, the uh, standard biopsy as well. So just to review three recent trials in active surveillance cohorts, uh, this is the uh, Peter Carroll active surveillance cohort. Uh, biopsy up, uh, by MRI upgraded 14% uh, uh, of the cohort based upon fusion alone. Again, this comes with a caveat that 9% of the Gleason 4 plus 3 would have been missed with fusion alone. So we can't throw away our standard biopsy right away. The uh, ASSIST trial, this was run uh, by uh, Lori Klotz, uh, a multi-center prospective study looking at systematic biopsy versus MRI uh, fusion plus systematic biopsy. 14% of the men, again, very similar number, were upgraded based upon their fusion biopsy alone. How it's a little bit difficult to interpret because there is no difference between the upgrading between arms. Uh, one of the, uh, the authors, uh, 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 put forward a possible explanation that uh, 
many of the centers were using the Artemis system and didn't have very much experience with the system uh, at that time. So again, this goes back to uh, uh, the sensitivity and, uh, and specificity of your MR target targeted biopsy is going to uh, weigh heavily based upon uh, your center's experience and your radiologist's experience. One last study that I want to highlight. So this is the NCI active surveillance cohort, 542 patients. 20.5%, uh, uh, this was done on confirmatory biopsy, 20.5% uh, with negative confirmatory biopsy, and this had prognostic value as well. So the patients that had a negative bi uh, confirmatory biopsy uh, had a progression-free survival that was 74 months versus 44.6 months. So uh, even if your, bio your MR targeted biopsy is negative, I think it has some value in counseling patients. So again, going back to our two problems, two solutions paradigm, and tackling the genomic testing. Uh, uh, so three commercially available tests, I'm sure you all are fairly familiar with all of these, but uh, Decipher, Prolaris, and Oncotype DX, all of them have been validated in biopsy specimen at this point, and all of them now have uh, some data either in uh, potential active surveillance cohorts or actual active surveillance cohorts uh, in their risk stratification. So the uh, Decipher Genomic Classifier, initially validated in biopsy specimen uh, to predict recurrence metastasis, uh, prostate cancer death after RP or uh, ra uh, radiation therapy. Uh, they, the score goes from zero to one, if you're not familiar, and they break it down into low, intermediate, and risk range, uh, and high risk ranges. Uh, this was recently uh, combined with NCC and risk grouping uh, uh, by uh, a group out of Michigan. Uh, they uh, can use this to further stratify using both the genomic classifier and the traditional uh, 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 clinical classifications. Uh, in an active surveillance cohort, this was recently published in uh, urology this year. Uh, of 102 NCCN low and intermediate risk patients. The uh, Decipher genomic classifier actually provided additional information uh, and was uh, more correlated with uh, Gleason upgrading than fusion biopsy. So uh, these two uh, 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 modalities, MRI bi biopsy and using a genomic uh, test, uh, may be synergistic. So Prolaris, this is the cell cycle progression score. Uh, this was initially developed in a very high risk uh, cohort and has sort of been retrofitted for this purpose. So um, uh, biopsy uh, uh, TERP specimen and then later biopsy uh, specimen validation. Um, this was also combined with clinical risk staging using the CAPRA system. It's a very simple uh, linear equation to develop the cell cycle risk uh, score. Uh, this was recently validated by Dan Lin's group, uh, looking at uh, a 90 percent cutoff. He likes to look at threshold cutoffs and the negative predictive values. So uh, of potential uh, low and intermediate risk active surveillance patients, if your CCR fell below 0.8, the negative predictive value for death uh, was 100 percent essentially. So one potential valuable uh, counseling point. So Oncotype DX, I will say uh, this, uh, this test was, was expressly developed for this purpose uh, as opposed to the other two that have been sort of retrofitted uh, for, for active surveillance risk stratification. So the initial validation was done in low and intermediate risk uh, cohort where each 20 po uh, point increase increased the risk of high grade disease or non-organ confined disease defined as adverse pathology. Uh, this was recently validated in the Kaiser Healthcare System with a long-term follow-up for a, a genetic test, 9.8 years. Uh, no patient with a GPS of less than 20 developed metastatic disease or prostate cancer death. Uh, that's important to note. Again, a very good point to counsel with a patient. The, in addition to that, five-year risk of metastasis uh, for the intermediate risk patients, patients that may be borderline for active surveillance, if their GPS was greater than 40, they were much more similar to high-risk patients. So this is a group of patients that you may consider pushing towards initial therapy. 
this again was recently validated in uh, active surveillance cohort uh, by uh, Peter Carroll's group, multiple publications recently in Journal of Urology. Uh, they not only did they validate the, uh, the primary endpoints, uh, but they also looked at serial GPS testing for patients that remain on active surveillance. And the GPS score, interestingly, re remains fairly stable and still correlates with adverse pathology uh, at the time of treatment. So this is one potential active surveillance pathway uh, for 2019 that has been proposed, both incorporating MRI and genomic testing, uh, using all of the available patient staging and grading data, uh, uh, data to inform the patient. So uh, one potential problem with this, obviously, is that uh, payers are unwilling to uh, cover MRI in the setting of negative or uh, biopsy-naive patients. So uh, I showed the data on that. I think the data for that is strong. The EAU endorses upfront MRI. They're the only ones so far. NCCN and AUA have, have yet to follow suit. However, uh, I think that there's a lot of uh, data now proving that it's uh, beneficial in the, in the conformatory biopsy setting as well. So you get your best biopsy, and then you do your genomic testing, and then you use all of this available information to counsel the patient. So I'm going to end with a quick case presentation. This is a, a patient from my fellowship at Cleveland Clinic. So a 69-year-old uh, healthy male uh, with both BPH and moderate LUTs managed with Tamsulose and very low-risk uh, prostate cancer, managed on active surveillance for over three years. Uh, he's presenting to your clinic for a second opinion. His PSA has been rising. He's very fixated on, this, on his PSA, uh, which is difficult to interpret in this setting of, of BPH LUTs and very low-risk prostate cancer. You review his chart, and prior to coming in, he has a uh, negative, uh, his most recent biopsy was negative uh, based upon a standard transrectal ultrasound biopsy. Uh, physical exam, the gland is large, uh, 60 grams, but no nodule. And what would be your next step? So, you know, in my thinking, I'm concerned potentially that we're missing a higher risk uh, index lesion that was just not sampled on a, on a biopsy done through the tra transrectal ultrasound. So uh, my thinking is there's value for adding a multiparametric MRI to see, make, to see if there's any uh, regions of interest. So this is his uh, sagittal view MRI. I thought this would demonstrate sort of his issues uh, twofold in, um, uh, in one screen. So he has a very large distended bladder, a large prostate with a median lobe, and there's a de decreased signal in the anterior uh, transition zone base. I don't know if you can appreciate that but with the lighting. So, uh, oops. There you go. So your, uh, the radiologist reads this as a PIRADS-4 lesion. This is certainly in an area in the anterior uh, transition zone in the base uh, that would not get sampled traditionally with a, a transrectal ultrasound biopsy. Uh, and because of its location, we elected to use a newer uh, transperineal system. So this is a fusion system called Quellus uh, that provides very precise biopsies, very precise MR fusion. Uh, and it's particularly useful in this situation with anterior uh, lesions. So we sampled it. There, two of those markers are uh, simulated markers, four, four samples. Three out of the four uh, were positive uh, for Gleason 3 plus 3. So again, he had a negative biopsy. Now you have good information from your optimized biopsy with three out of four uh, cores positive, 35% uh, involvement. So he's certainly not a very low risk patient anymore, especially with his PSA. Uh, we sent it for a decipher score, and the decipher score is low risk. So uh, the patient on counseling decided to continue active surveillance. I think that this is valuable information. You can let the patient know that his risk is low, uh, particularly with the decipher score. You can potentially encourage de-escalation or, or de-intensification of his uh, follow-up surveillance. Uh, 